concept. How many of y'all enjoyed last Sunday? Y'all enjoy the message on love? Was it awesome? I love it, man. I, I really feel like it's my life and my calling. Um, you know, we, we really, I mean, you know, we live in a time when a lot of things are failing. You know, I mean, I think that Brian shared a little bit of that. Uh, you know, a lot of things are failing. A lot of, you know, governments are failing. Financial institutions are failing. Churches are failing. Ministries are failing. Uh, money's failing. You know, Greek, the, the, uh, the, the Greek uh, economic collapse over there in that country is pretty astounding. And I don't say all those things to bring fear. I say all those things to bring this reality. How many know you have something that never fails? It's called love. And uh, your God is love. And so um, the Bible makes it very clear, you know, prophecy may fail, faith may fail, all these things may fail, but love never fails. And what I really feel like God wants us to do is to bring His love into our life so strong that we have a solid foundation that is not going to fail. And we can take this love, we can fortify our families with it, we can fortify our marriages with it, our ministries, our children. Everything that we have, we can put it on a foundation that cannot be shaken and will not be moved. And it's the love of God. Because the reality is, everybody in here, God is completely and totally in love with you right now. Okay, and, and His love, He's not like people. God doesn't love in different levels and different degrees. His love for you is full throttle, all out, loving you. Can I get an amen? And, and His love is, doesn't change. People's love may change, people's opinions may change, but God's love never changes. So, we already have this amazing love. It's already been given to us. Now, the question is, how many know that you ever loved somebody, but they didn't believe it? How I many you know if someone does not believe in your love, they cannot enjoy it? And that's, that's the issue. And so the love that God has for everybody in this room, for everybody on this planet is the same, but how I many you know different people believe in that love to different degrees? And the degree that you are believing in His love for you will be the degree that you're actually enjoying that love. And how I many you know what, and what we want to do is we want to enjoy that love because this love, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm talking about will drive fear out of your life to where you do not have to live in a state of worry. You do not have to live in a state of hopelessness. You don't have to live in a state where fear dominates you, but you can walk in this earth fearless and you can become invincible in His love. Now, what we looked at last, last Sunday was there's a difference between the, the old covenant uh, de, uh, uh, love and new covenant. Now, it, it just the love itself has not changed. How many know God does not change? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but the way He deals with people under different covenants does change. Under the old covenant, there was a demand made, placed upon mankind to love. How many know the entire law was summed up in this? Love God, love people, right? God made that demand under the old covenant. How many know nobody did it? How many know everyone failed? The very best the man that was after God's own heart, David, how I many know he failed miserably? Because the reality is the old covenant was to show us the frailty of human love. Amen. How many know human love is up and down? Okay? Your love and my love outside of God, how many know our love can fail? How many know sometimes you love and sometimes you don't? Can I get an amen? Can we be honest this morning, right? But under the new covenant, this is not, God has not come and placed the demand on you. God has actually come and given you a supply. He says, now, I'm going to love you first. Can I get an amen? When you don't deserve it, when you have not earned it, in the midst of your sin, in the midst of your failings, I'm going to reach down into the pit and I'm going to love you so strong that my love for you is going to transform your life. So under the new covenant, we're not actually trying to perform in our own strength. We are receiving a strength that's greater than our strength. How many know that His strength is made perfect in your weakness and in my weakness? Can I get an amen? So God comes to you and He gives you this no strings attached love. And His intention is for this love to come in you. And now you can fulfill the new covenant commandment, which is this, love even as I have loved you. That's an entirely different ballgame, isn't it? Now, God's going to love you first, and then His love for you is going to give you the ability to love Him back. His love for you is going to give you the ability to love each other. Can I get an amen? The New Testament is always based on supply. God blesses you first. 
And out of his love and blessing for you, you return back to him and return to each other. How many know it's a major game changer? Because we can demand that a glass be made full all day long, but it's not going to bring supply. And the purpose of the Old Covenant was to show the frailty of man's love. Okay, So now we're no longer under the Old Covenant, and now we're under supply. God's in love with you this morning. Can I get an amen? amen? And He doesn't love you more because you're in church. He doesn't love the Steuben Rocks more than us because they preach in Thailand. He doesn't uh, uh, love Allison more than us because she's going to, a different, uh, going to the Vietnamese to share the Gospel. How many know His love for you is not based on you? It's based on Him. How many know the sun shines to everybody? Because the sun shines. Can I get an amen? And your God is not going to base His love on you. He's going to base His love on Him because your God is love. Can I get an amen? And so this is a freeing reality that we do not have to selfishly compete for our Father's approval. We don't have to selfishly compete for love. We can sit down as sons and daughters of God, no longer slaves, and enjoy love and let love drive fear out of our lives. And then we can begin to walk in love and live in love and we will begin to look like our Father. Can I get an amen? This is based on supply. This is not based on demand. So in 1 John, um, we're going to take a look at uh, 1 John chapter 4. And I just want to get across one small concept this morning. And, and then we're, because we're not going to spend a whole lot of time because we've already spent some time. But this is the next step in where we're at. Now, before, I'm going to say the word perfect. What do you think of when, when I say perfect? Flawless. Flawless is a good definition. Anybody else got something? Complete. Flawless, complete, perfect. See, to me, the word perfect, um, it's a little intimidating. Because there's absolutely nothing perfect in my life. Except my wife. She's perfect. But other than my wife, man, there's nothing in me. I mean, my shoes aren't perfect. My hair sure enough ain't perfect. My shirt's not perfect. You know what I'm saying? If you go out and look in my car right now, you'll probably find a French fry from McDonald's somewhere in my car. You know what I'm saying? If you look in my closet, the organization of my closet, it's not perfect. And, and so that word, I don't have a lot of, per I have a perfect Savior. I have a perfect forgiveness, but I'm just a man. Praise God. And so that word perfect, I think a lot of times, can bring a sense of, uh. Because how many of y'all have ever spent time in church where you felt like you had to try to be perfect to impress other people? You know, and, and how many know that's not really what God's trying to do here? How many know church is not a trophy case, it's a hospital? This is where people come because we need help and we need to feed on Jesus. We're not here to be trophies so we can act like we're awesome. Can I get an Amen. And so anyway, all that being said, I want to take a look at this word perfect because there is a statement in 1 John 14 that challenges me as a Christian and excites me. And let me just read it. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Let's look at that. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. Everybody say perfect. In love. in love. So the Bible says that we can be perfect in love. That's a strong statement. Perfect in love. Now, as soon as I hear the word perfect, I immediately start thinking, ugh. Because of my concept of flawlessness. Okay? But what I want you to understand is that, now when I'm talking about being invincible in His love, I'm talking about this word perfect. There is a call of God to God's people, that you can be perfect in love. And that's what this whole series is about. It's about love coming into your life and being this unmovable, unfailing foundation where you can live fearless and without torment in this present evil world. Because the love of God for you is greater than your mistakes, greater than your failings, and it's greater what rises against you. But now we've got to take a, this, take a look at this word perfect because it, we need to take a look at it in the Greek. Okay? And so if we can have that, that definition on the board, because it may not be what we think in terms of perfect. What you shared complete is actually a little bit more accurate uh, of the definition that's in the Greek, which will magically appear in just a moment. And no pressure to anybody back there. I used to be in a church, man, where if someone waited a second, everybody got so mad at those people back there. Give those people a break, man. It's all good. We ain't trying to be perfect, flawless. <laughs> so, 
It's Strong's number, 5046. It's the word teleos. Now, it means to, to be complete, to make perfect, to accomplish, to bring to an end. Now, let's take a look at here. It's an, it's an adjective, and it means to mature from going through the necessary stages to reach the end goal. Developed into a consummating completion by fulfilling the necessary process. Now, all that's great, but I love this, sim this simple thing right here at the end. Reaching the end, it is well illustrated with the old pirate's telescope, unfolding and extending out one stage at a time to function at full strength and full capacity. So this word perfect is not talking about flawlessness, it's talking about a place of development into maturity. See, God wants to bring His love to maturity in your life. His, how many know that His love's already mature? But He wants to place this unfailing love inside of you and bring it to a place of maturity in you to where this love gets big, this love gets strong. God wants to make you strong in His love for you. God wants to make you strong in His love for you. You know, I was thinking about this when I was looking at my son. Uh, my, my son was waking up the other morning and I was just looking at him, you know, because I love him. And I was just looking at him. And I thought, you know what? And I thought to myself, I'm not always going to have all the answers for you. You know? And I thought to myself, I'm, all, I'm also probably not going to always be able to buy you everything that you want. And, and, and I sit there and, and thought about all the different things about him. And, but, but, then, but then I came to the end conclusion. I said, but you know what? You're always, and I, never, I, never, I didn't say any of this stuff out loud. He's asleep while I'm thinking these thoughts. But I think you can always count on my love for you. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, this guy right here is going to love you no matter what. I may not always have the answers. I may not always know the right thing to do. But you know, you know what? I'm always going to love you. And so you know what I want to do for him? I want to make him strong in his daddy's love. So no matter, no, what he, no matter whatever he faces in this life, no matter what he goes on, how many know as a human being he's going to make mistakes? But here's the thing. No matter what he does, I'm always going to love him. And I want him to get so confident in my love for him that he can always come to me with his weakness, with his failings. Because he does not have to perform for my love. He does not have to be perfect for my love. Daddy's got his back 24-7 no matter what. And so what I want to do is I want to bring a solidness into his life where he becomes confident in my love. Because if he can be confident in my love as a father, it will give him a platform where he can spring and be confident in the father's love. Y'all tracking me here? This is what God wants to do for you and wants to bring into your life. Now, we found this toy in our house. It is not the perfect representation of what I'm talking about, but it, but it does the trick. This word teleos. Everybody say perfect. It does not mean flawless. What it means is you have reached a, a place of completion at a set aim. Are you all tracking me here? Like when I first got saved, I, I understand God's love to some degree. I actually probably understand God's love better when I first got saved than later on. Can I get an amen? Because it's, when you, in the beginning, how I many know oh, you're in grace and you haven't touched a single toe into legalism yet because you've earned nothing and you're so thankful that you're forgiven? I could talk about that all day long, but I need to not because we need to move forward here. So when you first get saved, you're in grace and you're beginning to understand God's love. But God's intention is for you to begin in grace and to grow in grace. Can I get an amen? You don't leave grace and go into your own strength and go into legalism. We grow in grace and God's intention is for you to begin. In, see, a lot of times someone comes in and they say they're a drug addict, alcoholic. And we say, oh, God loves you. God loves you. We just want to tell you that God loves you. And they come in and we tell them that God loves them. And then a week later, we don't treat them like that no more. Because we done got them. They're notched on the belt. They're baptized. They're finished. Now get in line and serve. <laughs> you need to do something for the kingdom. What are you talking about? You think his love is free? And then all of a sudden, they began in this understanding of love. And they go back to that. And then they serve as a slave, not understanding that their father loves them. Anybody ever experienced that before? But the intention is when someone, it's funny, we, it, we're more successful at loving sinners than we are Christians. Because we think that sinners get the gospel, but Christians don't. See, the gospel is not just for people that know Jesus. How many of the gospel is for people that know Jesus? You need, I have good news for you. God's not mad at you this morning. You are forgiven. Can I get an amen? You are forgiven. 
Say, na 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 na. I'm forgiven. Amen. It's good news, isn't it? Because the moment you think you're not forgiven will be the moment that you cease to believe in God's love for you. And you will expect punishment. And we're going to look at that in just a second. So the intention is to begin in love and then grow in love and grow in love and grow in love till all of a sudden you have this teleos love. You have this perfect love. You have this complete love. And when that happens, you know what happens to you? You become fearless. You live your life untouched by the fears of this world. And so you have this tremendous peace that can't be bought. You have this, I mean, you know, there are people that are rich, but they don't have peace because money fails. You have this peace that you can't get out of a bottle. You have this peace that you can't get out of a pill. You have this peace that you can't get out of a church building. And it comes from your father loving you, you believing that love, and coming to a place of being perfect in love to where you have what the end of this verse says, he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So God <clears throat> wants to bring His love into your life so strong that you don't deal with fear dominating you anymore. If the Bible says it, then it's something that we can have. Amen? And so we're going to step forward here, and we're going to take a look at it. And I'm not going to take a lot of time. We'll pick up next week. Let's, let's drop back to verse 16, and let's take a look at the dynamics of how this works. How do we reach this point of becoming invincible in His love? How do we get to this place uh, where, where mature, a mature love happens? And first we're going to take... So 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it says, We have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Now here's the key. We have known and what? Believed. This, the major key here is that we believe in this love. Are you all tracking me here? This is huge. Now, this is where it's really important where you go to church at. And it's really important what message that you're continually hearing. Because how I many you know if sometimes you're hearing a message of God loves you, and sometimes you're hearing a message that God is mad at you, you're never going to have this period where you actually get rooted and grounded in love. You're going to live in a state of unsure about how your Father feels about you. And you won't be confident based upon your own ability to keep your own checklists of obedience. In other words, if I've checked my list, I've done my prayer time, I've done my church time, I've done my witness time, I've done my giving time, I've done this time, I've done that time, now I am confident that my Father loves me, and now I'm going to come in confidence. What if my son came to me one day and said, uh, you know, Dad, I just don't feel worthy to be your son because I spilled the Cheerios on the couch. And so I'm just not even going to come to the house today. I'm going to stay outside. Now, now how many know, as a father, that's going to upset me because here's the thing. He don't know who I am. He has no idea who I am. He thinks I'm loving him based on his ability to do everything right. And that's why legalism is so evil, because legalism presents a system of performance rather than an invitation to relationship. Christianity is not a system of performance. Christianity is where God saves you. Especially because you do not deserve it. And then you don't get saved and then enter into a system of performance. Can I get an amen? If my son came to me and he was heartbroken because he had spilled Cheerios and did not feel like I was going to love him, as a father, that's going to really upset me because our relationship is never going to be on solid ground. It's always going to be on his ability to do everything right. My son needs to know when he spills the Cheerios, Daddy still loves him. In fact, he needs to know a little bit more that Daddy loves him when he spilled the Cheerios. So he doesn't come and try to perform for me rather than rest in his sonship. Are y'all tracking me here this morning? And so God wants this thing to be based on His, on his love for you. But how many know it's our, our, our job to believe it? So you need to consistently hear how much God loves you. Can I get an amen? It's not a weak message. It's not the ABCs. It's the gospel. I know I can't sing. I don't care. I'm having fun. <laughs> it's the good news. See, the gospel paints an accurate picture of the way Father God feels about you. 
And if you hear a message that's divorced from the gospel, you'll hear a distorted message of your father's face. And you'll end up thinking he's mad at you and you will not draw near to him. You will run from him or perform, from him, but, or perform for him, but you'll never know him. Because relationship only happens in a place of safety and love. So, this message that comes from the New Covenant and from the pulpit is this. God loves you, and He is never going to stop loving you. Can I get an amen? Yes. Then immediately the question arises, well, Jeremiah, are you saying that God loves everything I do? No. I mean, you know, we make mistakes. I would prefer that my son did not spill the Cheerios in the couch cushions to where they reek and smell. I mean, you know, rotten milk is a horrible, nasty thing. <laughs> I would prefer that he did not do that because it's not good for him and it's not good for me. But here's the reality. When he does, he's still my son. Are y'all tracking me here? And so this message of love does not remove the concept of right and wrong. How many know wrong is still wrong and right is still right? Can I get an amen? And if you truly love somebody, you don't want them to do things that hurt them. And so there is a correction that comes in love, but that correction isn't to try to bring them into sonship. You, when you love someone, you correct them because you love them because you want them to have a good life on earth. Can I get an amen? It's true. It's good news. And so we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. He who abides in love abides in God. God wants us to live in awareness of this love. Now, 1 John 4 just a couple more places and we're closed. It's going to be real short and sweet today. Is it freezing in here or is it just me? I am like, I got icicles rolling off my nose. And if I'm cold, everybody's cold. My apologies. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah, amen. If I'm cold, everybody's freezing. 1 John chapter 4, and in verse 17 it says, now, this, now let, me just, let me just show you a little picture of what mature love looks like. What do y'all think mature love looks like? You know, and, and immediately, let me just say this real quick. When you think of mature love, you may think of a Christian walking around and, I'm loving God, I'm loving people, I am awesome, come be like me. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know what all this, y'all brought, y'all must have brought this in here with you, man, because it ain't always like this, amen, it's not a musical. I don't even like the movie Sound of Music, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't even like it. Um, but... You may have this picture in your mind of somebody walking around, just walking in love and loving everybody and loving God. And I want to show you here in verse 17, that's actually not the evidence of mature love. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. How many know that's really good? That's awesome. And we're moving towards that. We want that. If you love God and you love people, how many know sin's not going to dominate your life? Can you get an amen? Love's what sets us free from sin. But... I want to show you what the Bible talks about, the demonstration of this love, and it's just pretty astonishing. Verse 17, love has been perfected. That's that word teleos again. Love has been matured among us in this. This is how, right here. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. This is what love looks like. This that when judgment arises against you, what judgment are you talking about, Jeremiah? I'm talking about the devil coming in to try to steal, kill, and destroy from you by accusing you and bringing condemnation against you. You know how the devil steals from you? He tries to convince you that your father's mad at you. Because here's the reality. If you think God is mad at you and God is not for you, how many know it's going to be a real challenge for you to believe His promises? And so the enemy... The Bible refers to him, in the Greek, he's Diablos. It means the accuser of the brethren. In the Hebrew, it's, the hall, I mean, it's hall Satan, which means the accuser of the brethren. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, the devil is a hurler of accusation against you. Because if he can convince you that God's mad at you, your faith will be gone. And no matter how much God loves you, you will not be able to believe in that love because you will feel like you have been condemned. And you got to understand that word condemnation, at its very root, it means expectation of punishment. you got to understand that. That's what condemnation is all about. We don't define that a lot. But when you feel condemned, you're actually in a state of expecting punishment from God. And so when the, so when the enemy tries to bring something into your life like a flat tire or an unpaid bill or, or this or that, immediately the devil's like, the reason that happened is because God don't love you and God is mad at you because of what you did last week. And you know what happens to you? You cease to have an awareness of sonship and you go back into slave mode. And you try to earn a position that you've already been given. 
See, you're already seated in heavenly places if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've already seated in heavenly places. You're not trying to get somewhere or earn anything from God. Can I get an amen? One of the greatest lies of the enemy is, well, I'm just not, I'm not where I need to be. I just, I'm not where I need to be. Now, certainly, how I many know in our behavior and in our action, we, we, want to, we want to live like Jesus lived. Can I get an amen? But here's the thing. The moment that you think that you have to get somewhere, you will never arrive there. You need to sit down in your father's lap and say, I have arrived. Jesus seated me in heavenly places. I didn't do it. He did it. I'm going to rest in his love. As you rest in his love, it will cause your behavior to line up with your new nature. Identity is first. The reason Adam and Eve fell is they tried to do something to become something they already were. Yes. They, and the enemy tried to trick Jesus the same way. He said, if you be the Son of God, turn, these, turn this uh, stone into bread. And Jesus is like, I ain't performing for you. I'm not your monkey. I'm the Son of God, whether you think I'm the Son of God or not. Every one of Jesus' responses were to turn back to his identity and his righteousness as the Son of God. Can you get an amen? The devil's trying to get him performed. Could he have turned the stones into bread? Yeah! But he wasn't going to do it because the devil told him to. Because he ain't got to prove nothing to the devil. And the reality is Adam and Eve didn't have to prove anything to anybody either because they were already made like God. Can I get an amen? And so the enemy comes in and he tries to accuse us to separate us from the reality of our Father's love. But this is how your love's mature. Right here. Love has been matured among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? I'm talking about when the devil comes in and tries to bring you low and tries to convince you that God is not for you. You, in a place of boldness, rise up and say, God is for me because He loves me. He's my Father. Now understand, this boldness is not arrogance. Can I get an amen? How many know there's a difference between the boldness of a chihuahua and the boldness of a lion? How many know a lion demonstrates its boldness in rest? If you ever notice a lion, a lion is super bold, but he doesn't have to prove to anybody who he is because he already knows who he is. The righteous are bold as chihuahuas. The righteous are bold as lions. How I many a lot of religious people run around rapping like chihuahuas? You ever notice that? I'm not trying to be critical towards anybody, but how I many know if you know you are something, you don't have to prove it to anybody? And your God wants to bring you to a place where you don't feel like you got to prove anything to anybody and you can just rest in His love. And when the, when the accusations of condemnation start coming into your life, you display your boldness in this. No, nope. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm a son of God and my Father is for me. Can I get an amen? This is what God wants to bring into your life. That, that, those statements are very offensive to religion. But how many know they're very honorable to the cross? I mean, no, you couldn't make yourself right with God. Jesus did. So, love has been perfected among us in this, and we may have boldness in the day of judgment. And then we go into the last portion of this verse. Why? Because as He is, so are we in this world. I mean, we get to the place where we recognize our identities in Him. Can I get an amen? Where, uh, is there anything bad in Jesus? Is there anything wicked in Jesus? Is there anything twisted in Jesus? Is there anything perverted in Jesus? Is there anything dark in Jesus? Anything evil in Jesus? Where are you? That means you're awesome. <laughs> Can I get an amen? You are in Christ. And your identity is in Him. And so this boldness does not come from a place of outward performance. This boldness comes from a place of identity. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. Can I get an amen? He's the head, we're the body. But He is the one that we now identify with. Now, um, and then... One more place when we close. And then we go into verse 18. It says, There is no fear in love, but perfect teleos, mature love, casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made mature in love. And so in verse 18, we see something. There is no fear in love. Can I get an amen? And so there's no fear in love. Love and fear cannot abide in the same place. And God is love. And so, how I many know there's no fear in God? Understand that? Now, under the Old Covenant, man did not have the ability to love because the new nature had not been placed inside of them. 
And so man was go- the most effective way to govern an unregenerate man is fear of punishment. That's why we have laws. That's why we have prisons. I do what's right because if I don't do what's right, I'm going to get in trouble. How many of you know that's the low level? How many of you know there's a higher place when God takes His nature and places it down inside you and said, I'm going to love you so strong that I'm going to bring you to a place where you start to love me back and you love those around you. Y'all see the difference there? And, um, and then it says, but perfect mature love casts out fear because fear involves torment. And so what God wants to do in all of our lives is He wants to make you rock solid in His love for you. And He wants to bring that love to a place of maturity so that no devil in hell can convince you that your daddy doesn't love you. Y'all tracking me here? So that you become solid, you become fortified, you become invincible in His love, and you start to walk fearless in this life because you know that your God is for you. I said because you know that your God is for you. Because you start knowing that your God is for you. I mean, a lot of religious people try to talk you out of believing that God is for you. Like, well, why would God be for you? You're not doing this and this and this and this, and I'm doing this and this and this, so God's going to be more for me than He is for you. I mean, you know, that's the elder brother mentality. Elder brother can serve in the field all day long, but he doesn't know his father. The prodigal came to know the father quicker than the elder brother did. Because the, pro- the prodigal leaned on love rather than leaned on performance. But how many know Father loves the elder and He loves the younger? Can I get an amen? And He wants to bring both of them together in a place of love. But He wants to bring this love so mature in you that perfect love casts out fear. What are you talking about, Jeremiah? You and I should have the ability to love the fear out of a person. Because as this, as this love gets mature in you, this love walks around like a Holy Ghost bouncer. And says, all right, fear, I'm kicking you out of this family. Fear, I'm kicking you out of this house. I'm kicking you out of this relationship. Because how many know that, praise God, people out there are scared. And they need answers. And His name is Jesus. And the reality is, He loves them. And He does not want them to go through life alone. He wants them to go through life with Him, living on the inside of them. And as Christians, folks, it does not matter what we do at all if we don't love people. It means nothing. We can have all the faith in the world. We can have all the gifts in the world. We can have a beautiful church. We can have this. We can have that. But if we don't have love, we have absolutely nothing. But what we were taught in the past is you need to try harder to love people. How many of y'all, that doesn't work? That's old covenant. New covenant is this. You need to believe in the love that's already wrapping its arms around you. Let me love you. Let me fill up your cup. And then that love will grow so big and so strong on the inside of you that you'll be able to come up to somebody, give them a hug, and they're going to encounter Jesus. And that love that's in you is going to drive the fear out of them. How many know that the world needs this message, but how many know the church needs this message just as bad as the world does? Because a lot of times, man, Christians have been the least confident people on the planet. You know why? Because we came to our Father, but we weren't real sure if He liked us and loved us or not. And we live in a world that we don't belong in already. How many know the world hates Christians? And then we're not sure, the world hates us, then we're not sure if God hates us, and we walk around with less confidence than your average unsaved person. When the reality is, our Father, as we lay asleep at night, you know, I had those thoughts about my son. I, you know, I, my thoughts to him were, my, I've always, I'm always going to love you. How many know as you lay asleep at night, your Father in heaven is looking at you saying, I'm always going to love you. And I need you to get confident in my love for you. Because you're going to be a place that never fails. And, you're, and the love that's in you is going to have the power to bounce fear out of people's lives. Can I get an amen? amen? That's why the devil hates love. Yeah. Because yeah. love kicks him out, man. Where love is, the devil is not. That's why he doesn't want love in our homes, in our marriages, in our churches. And we've come to find out that we, we, we get this love by simply receiving it and believing it. And we'll look more about it in the future, but we're, we're done for right now. So, praise God. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's